In order for chemical reactions to occur, the molecules need to change. Atoms arranged in one particular way in the reactant molecules need to rearrange in order to form the product molecules. That means they need to change their conductivity. At least some chemical bonds will need to break and new ones will need to be formed. But how does that happen? Bonds are stable, breaking them is uphill, so that requires energy. Where does that energy come from? Why do reactions speed up if we increase the concentration of reactants or increase the temperature? How does anything ever change? We can measure reaction rates and we can write down equations as much as we like, but in order to really understand why chemical reactions happen and why their rates change the way they do, we need a theoretical model. We need a set of ideas that allow us to understand and explain what is happening at the molecular level during a chemical reaction. It turns out that what's happening at the molecular level is pretty violent because the molecules are just smashing into each other, which is why we call this model collision theory. Collision theory says that for two molecules to react, three things need to happen. The two molecules need to collide, they need to collide with the correct orientation, and they need to collide with sufficient energy. If any one of these three things is missing, there is no reaction. How fast a reaction goes depends on how many collisions between reactant molecules can successfully form the products. So let's consider each of these three things in turn. The collision between two molecules is pretty straightforward. At any temperature above absolute zero, molecules have kinetic energy, so they're always moving. If two molecules move in such a way that they hit each other, then that's a collision. But there are some points that we need to keep in mind. One point is that in solids, the molecules can vibrate, but they stay in place. They don't move around. Molecules of different solid reactants won't be able to collide because the molecules can't interact except at the solid surfaces. That's why you rarely see chemistry in the solid phase. For molecules to react, they generally have to be gases, liquids, or dissolved in liquid solution, so that the molecules are free to move around. A second point is that there is no inherent driving force that is pulling these molecules together or making them collide. Each molecule is moving in a different direction with a different speed. If two molecules happen to collide, it's entirely due to random chance. What do we mean by the correct orientation for a collision? To answer that question, we need to visualize the specific interactions between the molecules when they collide. Let's get small. Consider the reaction of nitric oxide with ozone to produce nitrogen dioxide and dioxygen. In order for this reaction to occur, this oxygen atom must be transferred from one molecule to the other. That means an oxygen-oxygen bond in ozone must break and a new nitrogen-oxygen bond was formed. In this reaction, these two things must happen at the same time, with the old bond cleavage and the new bond formation occurring simultaneously. Because collision orientation is random, most collisions will not be productive. The atoms in the reactant molecules won't be able to make and break the necessary bonds to form the products. Let's try a question on this collision orientation. The first step in the thermal decomposition of nitrogen dioxide is the reaction of two NO2 molecules together. Which orientation of molecules colliding is necessary for this reaction to proceed? Take a closer look at which bonds need to be broken and formed and which atom needs to be transferred in order to form the product molecules. That's right, because the oxygen atom is being transferred from one nitrogen to another, the intermediate structure has to involve a collision of one molecule's oxygen with the other molecule's nitrogen. The third requirement of collision theory is that the collision must have sufficient energy. So what does that mean? To answer that, we're going to need to draw some stuff. Grab your pen. A really important concept for reaction kinetics and for chemistry in general is something called the reaction energy diagram. We're going to use them a lot in this course because they are a simple but powerful way to convey a wide range of useful information about a chemical reaction. The reaction energy diagram is basically a graph. 
Energy of the system is on one axis, and the progress of a chemical reaction is on the other. It shows you how the total energy of a given group of molecules changes as those molecules transform from reactants to products. At the start of the reaction, we have the reactants, and at the end of the reaction, we have the products. In the reaction that we just saw, that means nitric oxide and ozone turning into nitrogen dioxide and dioxygen. But to get from the start to the finish, we have to go through a structure at the instant of collision where one oxygen-oxygen bond is breaking and the new nitrogen-oxygen bond is forming. Neither of those things is complete yet. This structure in between is called the transition state. We represent the bonds in the transition state that are in the process of being broken and formed with dashed lines like this. The transition state is an unstable arrangement of atoms. It's the highest energy point along the reaction pathway, higher energy than both the reactant molecules and the product molecules. So to follow this reaction path and to make products from reactants, the atoms must pass over this barrier and through the transition state. That means that the collision among the reactants needs enough kinetic energy to climb this energy barrier. The difference in energy between the transition state and the reactants, the energy barrier to the reaction, is called the activation energy. It's abbreviated as capital E subscript A. This activation energy can be measured quantitatively. It depends on the reaction pathway, so it will have different values for different reactions. But regardless of the conditions, it's always the same for a given reaction path. A collision between the correct molecules with the correct orientation still might not result in a successful reaction because the collision might not have enough energy to clear this barrier. Only the collisions with both the correct orientation and more energy than this activation energy will make the products. And the reaction rate measures how many times that happens each second. The reaction rate measures the number of successful reactions every second. In other words, the number of reactions that occur with sufficient energy to clear the activation barrier. Collision theory tells us what needs to happen in order for that to be achieved. A collision with the correct orientation and sufficient energy. So let's put this model to work. If the concentration of a reactant is increased, usually the reaction rate increases as well. According to collision theory, why is this happening? A greater concentration of reactant molecules means that all collisions have more energy. A greater concentration of reactant molecules means that collisions between the reactant molecules occur more frequently. A greater concentration of reactant molecules means that the reaction is more favorable. A greater concentration of reactant molecules creates a stronger attraction among those molecules, so they react more easily. No, greater energy in the molecules would increase the reaction rate, but simply increasing the concentration of the reactants doesn't increase their energy. No. Whether a reaction is favorable depends on the energy difference between the reactants and the products, but that's not the energy difference that controls the reaction rate. No, reactions don't occur because the reactant molecules are attracted to one another. Reactions occur because of random, uncontrolled collisions between the constantly moving reactant molecules. That's right. More molecules means more collisions, and a higher collision frequency means more successful reactions, so the reaction rate increases. This is one of the key experimental observations that collision theory helps us explain. Another important factor that controls the reaction rate is temperature. As the temperature is increased, the reaction rate also increases. According to collision theory, why does this happen? The reactant molecules are moving more quickly, so their collisions are more frequent. Reactant molecules have greater kinetic energy, so their collisions are more energetic. Increasing the temperature gives the reactant molecules more energy so the reaction is more favorable. All of A, B, and C. Two of A, B, and C, but not the third. Increasing the temperature increases the kinetic energy of the molecules, so they're moving more quickly and they collide more frequently. That will help to increase the reaction rate, but it's not the only reason. Increasing the temperature increases the kinetic energy of the molecules. So when they collide, they collide with more energy, and more of those collisions will clear the activation barrier. That will help to increase the reaction rate. But it's not the only reason. No, they're not all true. Both A and B are correct. Increasing the temperature increases the kinetic energy of the molecules, so both the collision frequency and the collision energy will increase. Both of those factors 
mean more collisions clearing the activation barrier and the reaction rate increases. This temperature dependence of reaction rates is a very important concept in chemical kinetics. We can model exactly how the reaction rate will change as the temperature moves up and down using a mathematical relationship called the Arrhenius equation. You'll get the chance to use this equation in your next class. So now we have a theoretical model that explains reaction rates. The more frequent and the more energetic the collisions between molecules, the faster the reaction goes. But a theoretical model is only as good as its agreement with experimental results. Do these predictions of collision theory hold up to the experiment? To the lab! Both of these beakers contain a red food dye in water. These two graduated cylinders contain bleach. The concentration of bleach in this one is about 0.67 molar, and in this one, it's double that. The bleach, in chemistry we call that sodium hypochlorite, reacts with the dye molecules in such a way that it changes their structure and the color disappears. If collision theory is correct, doubling the concentration of one of the reactants, the bleach molecules, will double the frequency collision. And that means the rate will double and the color will disappear twice as quickly. Let's try it. We could repeat this entire experiment quantitatively. We could precisely measure the concentration of the dye as it disappears. We could plot that data and determine a rate constant. But qualitatively, what this shows is the system behaves as collision theory would predict. A higher concentration of one of the reagents leads to a higher frequency of collisions, which means the rate increases. It worked. Now we'll repeat the experiment. But instead of changing the hypochlorite concentration, we'll change the temperature. One of the reactions will be at room temperature, and the other one will be at a temperature of about 40 degrees. If collision theory is correct, the hotter reaction conditions should mean more frequent and more energetic collisions between the reactant molecules. The hotter temperature should lead to a faster reaction rate. Let's try it. Again, the reaction behaves exactly as collision theory predicts. A faster rate resulted because of the hotter temperature. More frequent and more energetic collisions. It worked! So... Today, we learned about collision theory, a model that helps explain how and why chemical reactions occur. If a collision between two molecules has both the correct orientation and sufficient energy, a successful reaction results. Increasing the concentration of reactants will increase the frequency of collisions. Raising the temperature will increase their energy. Both of these factors will wind up increasing the reaction rate. We got our first look at the reaction coordinate diagram, which will play an important role throughout the rest of the course. We also briefly introduced the Arrhenius equation, a mathematical expression that relates all of the factors that control reaction rates and which we can use to measure activation energies. You'll have the opportunity to use that equation in more detail during your next class.